Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, how can you survive and thrive after a toxic workplace? And I'm in conversation with Lynn McCann. I'm Lynn McCann. I live in the middle of Lancashire. I um, have done most of my life, so hence the accent. Um, but I am a autism specialist teacher. Um, I run a business called Reach Out ASC and we are now a team of specialists and we go mainly into schools to support individual pupils. So we build an individual program around each child and we try to um, give the teachers all the help that they need, including resources and things like that, and kind of come alongside and mentor the teachers, um, which is good because we get the chance to see the child develop through, you know, the whole year and beyond. Um, so yes, and we have, we do training as well, um, mostly me at the moment, but I'm working on the others and uh, it's a great job. I love it. And I've only known you in the capacity of this work that you currently do. And you're one of those people who creates brilliant things all the time. And I'm forever recommending your stuff. And when people say, oh, I need some help with X. And I was like, check out Lynn's stuff. But obviously you didn't come here fully formed to this role. And what we're talking about today is how you kind of survive and thrive after a toxic workplace. And you recently um, disclosed on Twitter that you'd had difficulty before the current work that you find yourself in now and that kind of really struck a chord with people didn't it and are you happy to just explain a little bit about kind of what what you said and and, and some of the context behind that yes i must admit it was prompted by you because you were talking about um, feeling um, imposter syndrome <clears throat> and um you know i think gosh yes i have struggled with that quite a lot and i was wondering why and it just you know reflecting on where i'd come from and i thought you know it, it doesn't help when somebody's told you that they're putting you on in competitive procedures and that's kind of thought do you know it's time to be brave and actually admit that because i know now where i am now it's a long way from that that place and I've thrived, I've, I've survived. <laughs> and so, yeah, I thought maybe somebody else might be encouraged by me saying that and being honest. And uh, I think the community that we're in in Twitter is really supportive of things like that. And, you know, I had a couple of conversations with people afterwards um, on message, you know, whether I was able to encourage them. But actually, I've been to teaching for, um, oh gosh, I'm coming up for 30 years. Um, I'm 52. I went straight through school, through college, through uni, right into school again. So I've been wow. in school all my life. Um, I had a brief time. I worked in Preston Prison for six months, just on admin, by the way. Um, but yeah, <laughs> generally, um, so I feel like I've only ever been to school. But it's been a great, it was my passion. So, um, you know, it's something I really wanted to do. And I always wanted to work in special needs. That was prompted by when I was at secondary school myself. Um, we were asked if we would like to go and play with the children in um, a special school across the park. Um, and I was quite a lonely person when I was at secondary school. So I thought, well, nothing else to do. So mm. I went and I just fell in love with these children. I just had a great time. Uh, really, yeah, connected with them, enjoyed working with them and looking around the special school, thought, wow, this place is amazing. And I uh, thought, that's, no, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. So at 14, I made that decision. Uh, to get into this work <laughs> so I did I pursued that and I did um, a four-year B.Ed at Edgill um, it was still a college then before it was a university and um, did all the special needs sort of um, options that I could but then I was advised to go into mainstream school and get some experience in mainstream um, which I did I became a primary teacher um, for the first 14 years um, in that time I've actually been bullied twice in my uh, teaching career so once when I was in my 20s, um, and I didn't, I didn't do very well afterwards, uh, I really struggled and ended up with six months out of it. It was also a time where um, I'd had young children, well, I had one child, I had some miscarriages in between and I wasn't, I wasn't handling that very well. So that with all the stuff at work as well, you know, being, um, it was, sorry, I'm going way back here, but it was a time when Ofsted first came into being. Yeah. And so it was uh, the school's first obsess, obsted, oh gosh, but the head teacher became really obsessed with it and was going around sort of picking on certain people and telling them that they would fail in Ofsted, you know, with not really any framework around that for us to work with. So I struggled with that. But interestingly, when Ofsted did come in, I did all right out of it. 
but the damage had been done and the yeah. chipping away at me. So after I kind of survived Ofsted, I, I decided to leave um, because my mental health was in a really bad place. Um, I went off for six months, um, looked after my kids and then decided to get back into education part time. Um, and that was a nice time building up a confidence again. But um, when I was, um, so yeah, it was about 2002, something like that. I was asked to go back to my old school, um, a different head now who liked me. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> you've got really good skills. Will you come and do this job for us? So I went back and uh, stayed there for a couple of years and came across my first children I'd ever taught with who had autism diagnosis. Oh. And they were both really different. And we had some great training um, from the local child development centre. And I really got a bug. So after two years there, I decided I was going to leave, go back on supply and say, just send me to any special school that will have me. Because um, I just thought I needed some experience before I could apply for a job. Um, I went to this autism specialist school for the second job that they gave me and uh, never left. Oh, really? <laughs> I was there eight years. Wow. <laughs> Um, wow. And I just the first day I walked in, I just thought, oh, I felt like coming home. It was just fantastic. The children had quite, um, you know, complex needs. A lot of them were um, pre-verbal and um, they were just brilliant. I loved it and I just got it. So um, fortunately, it was the head teacher there at the time was really good, gave us loads of training. We did our um, qualifications through Birmingham University, sort of distance learning and uh, we had loads of things like we did the certs training and he got the the um the authors from america to come over and do the training with us and things wow. like that so you know we did i did really well out of the training and stuff that i had then um and then after um what was it after a couple to about three years of being there he said well we, we need to set up an outreach service you're the only one who's worked in mainstream before you can do it lynn and mm -hmm. just gave me this carte blanche to set up this whole new service that the school was going to provide. Um, there was a great HLTA that I worked with and the two of us just invented it, made it up and it wow. was brilliant. Um, but I think what I really valued was that the head teacher valued my skills enough to say, you know, we know you're a good teacher. He actually said that to me. <laughs> it's like a rare thing, isn't it? Were you able um, to hear that, bearing in mind that you'd had your confidence kind of eroded yeah, in previous positions? Yeah. I think working in a special school and being where I'd always wanted to be really built me up. But in between those times, I'd also um, had some counselling and um, I'm a Christian, so I'd had Christian counselling and it really worked on my, where my sense of self-worth was. Yeah. And what I was grounding it in, was I grounding it in being a teacher or was there more to me than that? And that was really helpful. And that became like a foundation that protected me for the second time that I was mm. bullied, which I am getting to. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like I need to explain the context. No, um, I hear, do, do. It's fascinating to hear anyway. I don't know if everyone yeah. listening, but I would really like to hear it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So after um, setting up that service, we set it up and it was brilliant. I really enjoyed it, learned so much, you know, on the job, was taking the expertise from the specialist school into mainstream school, making all, learning how to adapt it. And because I had worked in mainstream school, I was really able to understand the teacher's difficulties, you yeah. know, that they've got this class of 30 children. And I still feel that that's the basis of all my training now. You know, I know what it's like for you. So let me help and make yeah. it easier for you. Let me show you the way to put this in place amongst everything else you're doing. Because <clears throat> everything you do is really practical, isn't it? It's very mm. quick to kind of, I think you, you do a brilliant job of translating what we know works into kind of relatively simple stuff that someone who might not have had that training or that experience can actually pick up and run with. Um, even if they maybe don't know all the complex kind of science or research behind it, they can use it and it works, right? Yeah, and I do that because I don't feel very clever. <laughs> and I just, I'm surrounded by clever people. I mean, you know, you're, you're just amazing. And all these people who can talk all this amazing theory, which I soak in, but then I have to make it into something practical to kind of understand it myself. So mm. um, I realise, well, if that's my skill, I can use that in my job. Just for um, what it's worth, what you just described is exactly how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all just you know <laughs> anyhow carry on no I know what you mean but that's why that imposter cut I don't know where we have this thing that you know we, we need to sound clever to be clever but we, we don't do we really not really we just, we just need to do the right thing by the kids I think <laughs> exactly exactly and I love 
like observing and, and getting to know children and just w looking at how it is for them. And I think when you've got that sort of insight, you can sit, sit in a back of somebody's classroom and watch a child who, who's autistic, like walking around and seeing what they, what they like recoil against. So you can see, oh, there may be a sensory issue there and, and the privilege of being able to watch and observe and then pass that information on and talk to the child in a way that they can communicate and find out what it's like for them and work up from that in your programs. Yeah. It's just been fantastic. So we did get a lot of good feedback for our outreach services. Um, I learned to deliver courses, which I'd never done before. Um, and then we got a new head teacher and you know really clever person um i'm going to say a person i don't want to give away any you know sort of specifics because i'm, I'm you know i'm not into sort of naming and shaming or anything but um yeah the, the atmosphere of the school changed and the focus of the school changed and you know there's some good things in that um but also there were some things i started to sort of feel very uncomfortable about so there became a very um sort of very intense focus on curriculum Mm -hmm. And considering the needs of our children, I just felt really uncomfortable about that. Like, you know, you've got to make so much um, impact in geography, for example. But actually, I think, well, but can I not work more on their communication needs or their, you know, sensory understanding? So but at the same time, I became a forest schools leader. Um, oh. I just just because I like being outside and just I said would anybody like to train to be a forest schools leader and I, yeah me 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 <laughs> that, that took a year but that meant that as well as my outreach work I was doing PPA cover for other teachers and I was able to do forest schools then with all the classes which was fantastic so it was working hunky dory great job wonderful time um, and it, there was one really strange thing where the head teacher said to me once I really wish I was doing your job Oh, that's a bit strange. And I said, I'm really sorry, but I don't think I'd like to be doing your job thinking, you know, me and a head teacher, no chance. I just haven't got the skills to do that job. It's a big job. You know, I said, you've obviously got, um, you know, more responsibility. This is the job for me sort of thing. Um, and it was just strange, but I let it go. But after that, I kept getting little niggly comments about things like sort of pulling me down and criticizing what I was mm. doing. Um, and and I know this by talking to other people, you know, that this often happens, doesn't it, when people are bullied in the workplace. Mm. Um, and it's kind of, I learned the phrase um, since, gaslighting. And it's yeah. like, oh my gosh, that makes sense. You know, you're made to feel like you're failing. You're the one who's getting things wrong. Um, so it kind of came to head again with another Ofsted coming up um, where I, I was covering um, somebody else's class and um i was judged on i had an observation where the children hadn't made enough progress in half an hour now these were children with severe needs and the fact that they were all calm and engaged in the lesson was just amazing we had yeah. children who had like two to one staffing because of their needs you know they very quickly go into meltdown if we didn't really manage things well um and it was like what do you mean they don't they've not made enough progress in this half an hour and they could never quantify what it was and yeah. and I then began just loads and loads of well we're going to give you extra observations and this was just one afternoon in my whole job wow yeah you know? and it was just and then I said well would you prefer the deputy head to to observe you and I thought well yeah actually because you're making me so uncomfortable but he came in and he was saying the same things as she was saying it like a script and no matter what collect evidence I collected no matter what I did it was never good enough um, and then when we had Ofsted um, they came in the room I just happened you know be teaching that class that afternoon but it wasn't just the Ofsted inspector it was the head teacher as well and the Ofsted inspector was inspecting the head teacher inspecting does that make sense wow yeah that's a bit meta but yeah I think I get that so the head teacher's observing and Ofsted are observing the head teacher observing kind of yeah and yeah. but this is a class again a very very high needs class and they've got two extra adults in there that they don't really see very often one of them was a stranger and one of the children did have a meltdown and we dealt with it in all the ways that we do you making sure she was safe and looked after and i was absolutely a hold over the coals afterwards um Why? i hadn't because i hadn't taught the children anything right um because <laughs> you're a bit busy uh, keeping them safe presumably yeah, yeah and you know the other children had actually engaged in the lesson and um 
and you can only understand this I think fully if you've been worked in a specialist school really um, and I was devastated but after that it was an absolute persecution and it was nothing about my actual job my actual job as an outreach teacher it was yeah but if you know if you and I was threatened um, I was called into office um, after many more sort of meetings and stuff and my fault is I always went in on my own and I really wish I'd taken somebody with me now because all mm. the threats then were not recorded um, or there was you know never anybody there to speak up for me or afterwards but it came to a head just before half term and in the October and um, I sat there and said but my job is this outreach teacher why aren't you taking the evidence from that to, to look at my skills and what you know this is a job you've given me to do why why aren't you measuring me on that and um, she said, well, if, we, if you can't um, teach properly in the classroom, we can't even give you that job. We can't trust you to be out and about. And we're going to put you on incompetency procedures. Mm. Oh, sorry, I'm getting emotional now. It I'm was not surprised. Just, it was like somebody stabbing me. And it was like, in the six weeks, we've got six weeks to improve or else. Um, what did they mean by improvement? What were they expecting to see? Did you know? I have no idea. I have no idea. I think... I'd kind of been in amongst this spring, I'd actually got in touch with my union and they had been like no help at all. I right. said, well, go away and pretend you're a, um, a newly qualified teacher and go and, you know, gem up on it. And I thought, but I've been teaching for 20 odd years. You know, if you give me something, I've been learning it all the time in this place. I've been doing professional development and, you know, trying to put it in practice and writing courses on it, which are really effective with, and I couldn't make sense of it really. Um, and I still don't. And I just think, you know, I was being picked on. I was being persecuted. I was, they were making, ex, you know, and I might not have got, and it might have been some, I, you know, and I think, well, was it my fault? What did I not get? What did I not see? What did I not understand? And I spent a lot of time thinking, what have I done wrong? You know, I think all of us teachers do that when we're being mm. bullied, when we're being undermined. We're so passionate about getting it right, aren't we? And as soon as somebody says we've got something wrong, we go into, oh my gosh, it's me, what have I done wrong? And where was the trigger of where I, I suddenly started going wrong? Um, you know, what have I not done? And, um, and it's because all the, the, the sort of standards are always changing and the boundaries yeah. are always moving. Um, so I remember getting in my car because this was at the end of the day. After, fortunately, the meeting was at the end of the day. I got in my car and halfway home, I had to stop at the side of the road and phone my husband up and say, I was like, you know, gulping with like panic and just saying, unless you talk me down, I'm not going to get home. I, I can't drive. And bless him, he did. Um, and I got home and he just gave me time to sort of calm down and, and just encourage me and and um, I just needed then to think, well, what am I going to do about this? Am I going to go through this? What are my options? The first option was to go off sick. And I'll reveal a little bit more about the school situation in a moment. But um, I wasn't the only person who'd done that. Um, I think, well, I could six months on pay. You know, that's an option, isn't it? I could do that. Um, but I just I felt that was giving in. That was defeatist. And because I'd had this foundation of my worth is not in my job my worth as a person is is somewhere else it's it's apart from the this is a job that I'm doing I'm passionate about it and I love it but it isn't the whole worth of me so there's something yeah. else that's that that I don't want to give into that I don't want to be ill again mm. I've had it was horrible and um so what what is my other option but because this had been building up over years, this little, little voice in my head would be saying about my outreach work, you know, you could do this on your own. And in Lancashire, they'd made a lot of their specialist teachers redundant a few years ago. So there are actually quite a few independent specialist teachers around. Nobody doing autism. Um, and I thought, well, they're doing it. I could, I could actually do this, couldn't I? And that little germ started to grow. Um, that little seed had a little roots and shoots. So it was coming up to October half term and I thought, right, OK, let's let's take a big leap of faith. And I gave my notice in. And as soon as I handed her that resignation letter, I got, um, well, it's OK, we don't need to do incompetence of procedures now. It was like her triumph, she'd won. Wow. But I thought, but you haven't, because actually I've got a plan. I've got an exit plan now. 
and I'd certainly recommend doing that to anybody who's doing this, you know, sort of an exit plan. It just gives you more hope. You don't have to spiral downwards. You've got something else to focus on. Um, so in my last six weeks before Christmas, I um, pinched every idea I could think of. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the things that I'd made, I took home in bags, you know, one night at a time and stuff like that. Um, and I had to be ready. So I finished my job in December and I had to be ready to start the new job in January because I couldn't afford not to. Wow. But because they weren't then replacing me, so that says a lot, doesn't it? They weren't going to replace me. They wanted to sort of end that, see, that, um, that job of mine. I, um, I, the, some of the schools that I would, had built really good relationships with over the outreach work said, oh, we'll, we'll still keep you. And so I had a little bit of work to start with. Um, oh, that's great. So yeah, which says a huge amount. Did that help to kind of, yeah, remind you of your faith in self that actually, yeah, yeah, outside of the school itself, people did want to work with you. It took a long, long time to build up the confidence, but that was a really good start. And I thought, well, okay, let's just, and I was so busy, like finding out how to run a business. Yes because you don't know about tax yes, it's insur- hard, isn't it? <laughs> insurance and dbs's and yeah. one of my schools said oh we'll do your dbs for you and i thought oh great you know they were so supportive um so yeah i was so busy then i didn't have time to focus on what had happened and so the processing of what i've been through just took time then yeah um so going back to what i said earlier there's a bigger picture is actually i wasn't the only person bullied um mm. in the first two years of that head teacher being there and um, there were four deputy heads and each one left saying they couldn't work with them wow Gosh. um and then i'd say in total there was probably a dozen staff who left or moved on because of this being picked on wow and did you ever talk to each other about it or was it just one of those things that you each dealt with on your own and moved on at first we all kind of dealt with it on its own you kind of knew it was happening but basically we're all in survival mode of I'd, i'll keep my head down and then it doesn't yeah. happen to me because yeah. a bully has a lot of power don't they they do they have a lot of power and when they can threaten your livelihood which is what yeah. happened to me and i know it happened to other people then you know if you've got a family and children i mean my children were teenagers at the time and i thought i can't afford not to work so you no. kind of keep your head down and, and it's awful because if we rallied together, we could have really helped one another. The, the tale goes on, though, that after I left, there was a few of them all in the same union who did actually get together and with a really good union rep actually challenged this. And there was, um, there was actually um, an accusation, a formal accusation of five counts of bullying. Wow. five other people five, um, gosh. It, it went through to the tribunal or whatever it is and um was was found to be upheld so wow. the person was that the head teacher went on gardening leave as you do went through this tribunal was found to be guilty i suppose and then lost a job wow. um, but then appealed <laughs> so yeah. it, but but it took i think two years to go through that process but i was well away from it then i don't know whether i could have coped with that but i have such admiration for those who actually got together and went through that and so hard when you're right oh. down as well like i don't know whenever i've experienced i've never experienced it on the anything like the level that that you're talking about but i have had like bits of discomfort in the workplace let's say and it does it 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 challenges everything you think you know about yourself doesn't it and I think you've become very quiet almost and yeah the idea of actually standing up and doing something strong in those moments I yeah I don't think it's something I could have done I could do you know on behalf of someone else having completely stepped out of it and wanting to correct that situation years later but at the time just like you you, you, yeah you, 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 you almost hide really don't you you're in self-preservation mode and and, Mm. you know other people I've talked to since you know I did that little tweet it's the same thing you're kind of in complete self-preservation mode you're worried about your income and your family you're worried about your own like because when you're a teacher it's it's a vocation isn't it yeah and you put a lot of passion into it and a lot of time you know it takes so much time out of your family life you know, you're working in the evenings, you're working in the weekends. And in the time when I was trained to improve and not yeah. knowing what I should be doing, I worked every single night till, you know, 10, 11 o'clock. And, wow. and, and I worked six hours on a Saturday and a Sunday and just tried to have a little break to actually spend time with my family. And yeah. I think, 
what kind of job is this? And I know that those who are going through this kind of thing end up working more to try yeah. and make things right when actually you the problem isn't, yeah. it's not your problem really. Yeah. When you think about it, it's that person's problem who actually should be helping and supporting you and not persecuting you. If they don't like you, tough. <laughs> if they don't like, if you're, if your work isn't up to standard, then they should be put in support and help in place to help you get there without all that judgment of you're a crap teacher. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a really important thing to point out, isn't it? Is that, yeah, some people will underperform in their job and that shouldn't be the cause of um, kind of dispute and difficulty. That should be a moment where, as you say, we, we come together and we think, well, what can we do to support and guide and, and, and build you up? I think, yeah, kind of, having high expectations of high challenge but also high levels of support is is a really good workplace actually isn't it but mm. that's clearly not at all what was happening for for you and all those others in your school how did you feel when um you know it was that little time later and and the the head was taken to tribunal and and yeah almost presumably it would have in some way made you realize that this was not in any way you're imagining because I think sometimes you can question it can't you I mean yeah how did that all feel for you how did you feel about it it was strange really uh, as again because it was been my second time of going through it I did actually have some self-preservation in in place um, as I was going through it so I was determined not to be bitter mm. so when that actually happened I actually felt very sorry for that person um, mm. to think that they had had gone on the wrong track so much in the way they dealt with their staff that had destroyed their career and I felt sorry for them and I kind of still do um the fear had gone because by then I'd kind of established a little bit of a business that I think when I first started I was afraid that my old head teacher would bad mouth me in the county and that oh, you know yeah. and I think I had this fear behind me but I think once I was out of way I wasn't really bothered although in a way I was in direct competition with the school mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah it was it was a strange feeling it felt like justice had been done and it felt yeah. the right thing but I did feel sorry that somebody couldn't see that the way to manage people is not that way no. um, and I know head teachers are under massive massive pressures themselves they're yeah. under a lot of you've got to do this you've got to do that and maybe they feel so overwhelmed like that that they just pass that pressure on yeah and it make, it, it does make you wonder what what was the context there because this is you know the thing I always teach my children when they uh, come across people who are unkind towards them is just to remind them that often hurt people hurt people mm. don't they and mm. we don't know what the story is for those children in this instance who are being unkind but more likely than not there's something going on for them that's that's mm. kind of triggered this and yeah it, it seems likely there must have been something going on for that head teacher and it doesn't make it in any way okay but um uh, yeah I, I, it's it's very complicated isn't it all the different feelings that go with that yeah and you do you feel every feeling going you feel you feel like powerless and um you feel oppressed and mm. and yeah depressed at times as well but i think um in turn deciding not to be bitter it's kind yes. of tied up with my faith I'm a Christian and the idea of forgiveness yes. and it was a situation where I kind of had a choice I could put that in into practice so forgiveness is not really as much as excusing what somebody's done it's more about protecting yourself mm -hmm. when you forgive somebody you kind of let go of the hurt that they have, get, have put on you and you let it go so actually I was protected by that forgiving her it didn't mean that she didn't do a wrong thing, but also it means that I don't have to carry that around with me for the rest of my life. That's such a good way of looking at it, because I guess that all the time that you held on to it, it was doing you harm. But she's probably forgotten about it and moved on to the next person who uh, was yeah, mm -hmm. encountering those those challenges from her. And did you um, kind of revisit counselling or anything in that time? Or were you able to use what you'd learned previously um, when you moved on from the second Okay. Um, I didn't go to formal counselling, but I had some really good friends who were good counsellors, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. so, yes. um, we had long walks and lots of chats and um, yeah, they were really good in sort of resetting my mind 
um, mm. and letting me just talk about it because you need if you hold it inside it does sort of eat away at you doesn't it so it does. I think you know I'd say that to anybody really is if they are going through this is just to get some good friends around you I neglected my friends because I was just working I was mm. just so engrossed for you know possibly a year or more into trying to get this right um, and working so I hadn't seen my friends and I thought no I need to reconnect with the things outside my job that actually are probably I mean my family I mean my teen, you know my teenage children they you think they don't need you and they go off and do their own things but they do yeah. um and I was kind of rushing through my tea and rushing off to work and I thought, no stop and just spend time at the dinner table and talk to them and ask them about their day and just get my mind off what's going on yeah. in my head um, and I say I'm just connecting with some really good friends who I could go for a walk with and they just let me ramble on and then just say right Lynn you've rambled on but you know this is important this is the truth um, and I love you very much they used to tell me you know and no. that was just a big boost um, and I think counselling can come in lots of different formats can't it so I've had kind of formal counselling which is brilliant but also really good friends can counsel you as well, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, as you say, reconnecting with the things in your life that make you feel whole and, and that are other parts of your kind of character and personality. Did you ever talk to your children about it? Yeah. What yeah. did they say? Um, they were, I think, I think I talked to them more afterwards because I think, you know, they needed to see me out of it. I don't think in the middle, I think they knew what was going on, but we've always been quite open and honest with our children about life anyway. So when my daughter was at um, high school, she had a time of being bullied and we'd sit down every night and we'd actually just pray for the bully, uh, but would also say, you know, in the same way, let go of the effect they've had on you today. At the same time, we were in school and we were saying, sort this out, you know, yeah. doing all that as well. But it was kind of, you know, she'd seen that we'd been through that with her and it, and it had resolved itself in the end, it had stopped. Um, and um i said right okay i told you to do that now mummy has to put this well mummy i was there were teenagers mum has to deal <laughs> with that as well um you know i've got to do the same i've got to practice what i've told you so it was you know we kind of live life together and and be quite open about the problems that come up so i'm hoping that they learn some skills that when they come across problems in life yeah uh, do you think you were a good role model in how you managed it i don't know you'd have to ask the children <laughs> <laughs> um I don't know that's a judgment from somebody else isn't it whether you're a good role model but I, well, I guess how be. would you judge yourself on it if you look back on it you said you, you mentioned before that one thing you would have done differently is you wouldn't have gone to those meetings alone so that's I think that's a really important piece of advice mm. for anyone who's listening who might be facing something similar and sadly when you send that tweet it seemed that there are plenty of people out there who are in mm. this and they feel alone so taking someone with you but is there anything else that you think you you did you did right or perhaps that you would do differently on reflection um yeah i think having just uh, give yourself a bit of time even if you take a few days off to just sit there and think about what is it that i am good at and what is my passion because if you look back in your teaching career there are things that you've done well and there are things that you're really interested in and passionate about and it's kind of I mean I'm a great one for writing things down on big pieces of paper because I can't keep it all in my head and when you're stressed anyway the, the you know it goes round and round in your head doesn't it so I map it out and say well these are the things I do think I'm good at the things I'm proud of things I have achieved these are the things I'm confused about and and also assess whether the people who are bullying you are going to change. Mm. I think that's often we stay in a place thinking that it's going to change. And actually, sadly, I don't think that's the case unless somebody leaves. Mm. And, I, and it's very hard for you as a, a person being persecuted to actually then change the persecutor. It's, it's, mm. it, it's, you've got to be honest about that and then if that's the case and i've seen this a lot on twitter people encourage people to give it one more go there was a bit of a campaign about that maybe sometime on twitter education but it's like okay then if i've got these skills could i use them better in a place where i had a better boss basically if that's what you're asking yeah. yourself um and that being able to move on when you're already feeling down yeah and 
you could, you've no headspace to plan ahead, have you? Because it's all encompassing. So, I, you know, I would say take a week off and just take that time to think this through. And then what I built in was an exit strategy. I think I heard it on the telly somewhere, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, about retiring, having an exit strategy. Oh, I'm not retiring yet, but that sounds a good phrase for me to sort yeah. of hone in on to. So I started planning. I started planning my way out on what else I could do. And I considered, honestly, I considered working on the on the tills at Morrison's. I thought, well, if nothing else, I can do that and I can yeah. be friendly and I can enjoy, you know, meeting people every day. Um, if it takes that, that's what I'll, I'm prepared to do. But actually, I love passionately teaching autistic children. So maybe there's a way I can find something else doing that. So anybody in that situation, it is self-preservation. And, but it's also finding the hope that you've got for moving on. And, um, and if you need to take time to do that, I would say take it. You know, they can do without you for a few days while you sort your head out, get some advice if necessary, talk to other people um, who you trust. Um, and really, you've got to ask that question, is that person going to change? Am yeah. I going to change them? Um, so it, maybe it's not the right place to stay. And that's hard, I think, isn't it, to walk away? Absolutely. Absolutely. And particularly if you, you know, you're, you're so often those of us working in education do it because, you know, we don't do it for the glory or the money, do we? We do it because we really, really care about the children. And it must be hard to walk away from children with whom you've built a good relationship and a place where you've given so much of yourself. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, from what, from what you said, it, it sounds like that it does become impossible actually to to be who you need to be and to be able to to, to provide the, the the children with what they need without it coming at such a huge cost to yourself i think you've hit the nail on the head there your, your greatest sorrow is letting the children down that was i mean i cried and cried and cried about that really um because you know really cared about the children and i was thinking i was abandoning them and their families and that was really hard I really had to think, well, okay, there are other families and children that I could still help. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that those children were in any danger. No. You know, it was... Um, but you'd invested in them. Yeah, yeah. So. But then think how many people you reach now. And I think that's, that's why when you first were so honest about this and, and thank you for that actually I think it was a it was a really important conversation to start and there are you know lots of people out there who I think are feeling a bit less alone in this right now because of of you starting that conversation but when you you started that conversation I think people were just so surprised because but you're Lynn and you run this amazing <laughs> consultancy and you've got it really together and you've reached so many people and I think quite a lot of people did say well maybe it was a blessing in disguise because if that hadn't happened then you wouldn't be doing all this incredible work now and I wouldn't be using your resources and you know so on and so forth and how did you feel about that because you had that there was basically those two kinds of response wasn't there there was the one which was like oh gosh me too please help ah <laughs> and then there was well, it's amazing that you're doing this great stuff now. So maybe it was good. <laughs> yeah, and I can see that now. And that's one of the reasons I felt able to talk about it because, you know, we, we all would benefit if we could have hindsight before we meet, you know, beforehand, mm. couldn't it? But I think it's what we have a choice, don't we, to do what we, we, we like with what's happened to us. And bad things happen. That's life, isn't it? And the first time this happened to me, I didn't handle it very well. I struggled to pull myself back into teaching and it took quite a long time. But also in that time, I dealt with a lot of issues that were not apart, were apart from teaching, but were just issues about my life. So yeah. I think I, I, I really remember I grew up as a, a young carer and there was a lot of undealt with issues around that. That mm -hmm. in that time, because I was kind of examining and um, getting um, counseling and examining where I was in life, I actually was able to deal with a lot of things that really helped me kind of, I suppose, grow up a bit. Um, it sounds like you had them. a lot on because you said you, you um, experienced miscarriages in that time as well, which again is huge oh. and people don't talk about, do they? But No, no, you know, I'm 52. I've lived a bit, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I grew up as a young carer. Um, my mum had mental health difficulties and um, my, my kind of, my parents divorced when I was 19 and I, it was a horrible, my teenage years were awful, horrible. And I just saw going away to uni as a way out of it, really. I love my parents very much, but it was a hard time. I was the eldest of four children, so I was the one who was given the caring responsibilities. Yeah. But I kind of, as a surrogate mum, I sucked. I was rubbish at it. <laughs> 
and um, I've kind of apologised to my siblings since and you know, it's brought us closer just all talking about that time but they did see me as the person who was you know sorting them out and, and mm. guiding them through but you know at, between the ages of 12 and 16 you're not really prepared to be a mum are you and no. um, and on top of that I was I was quite a studious child at school so um, I was very concerned that I had to be good and I had to do all my work so I was kind of looking after my mum and my siblings and trying to do my homework and do you know I had a lovely lovely um, form tutor at school he was my English teacher which is why I absolutely adore English um, and I still keep in contact with him now but he just understood me and he and he kind of like helped me and and like even in my last report uh, when I left school he wrote you know how much effort he was the only one who knew I was a carer basically wow. and, and I'd recognized that and I really appreciate him for that um because in those days there was no recognition of it there was no, no help you just got on um, no. I was in a similar situation and I don't think I would have even known that I was a young carer like mm. I don't think the concept even crossed my mind and certainly no one ever talked about it no they didn't no, it's, you just do what you do, don't you? I mean, I grew up in 1970s and 80s in uh, a poor area of Preston and it was just life. And yeah. well, there were some good bits about it as well. My dad worked really hard to sort of keep us going and he took us out in the countryside a lot. And we had a park near us. And we're in those days, you know, where kids were feral. You just yeah. were sent out in the morning and said, come back when you're for tea, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I appreciate that because it, it kind of was relaxed and there wasn't a lot of pressure on us. So mm. I survived. Um, um, I didn't cope so well with it in my later teenage years. So by the time I'd got round to this, um, you know, miscarriages and stuff like that, it kind of brought up a lot of my past that I was struggling with. Yeah. But again, just I would recommend counselling, you know, a good counsellor can just really help you work out and leave behind the, the yeah. things that you've not dealt with. And I think dealing with things in life, if you, we don't have a lot of space and time to do it, do it in this no. world. But if we can and sort of park that um it's not that they have to carry quite a lot of incorrect beliefs can't we and because we never voice them we don't question them and actually having a grown-up who you respect saying let's pick that apart a bit what's the evidence for that can actually (laughs) be really helpful can't it yeah yeah it did it transformed the way i think you know and i'm still quite what's the word you know I think a lot of us are quite humble, humble about ourselves. I don't really believe I'm very good at this, but I'm trying. You know, it's kind of that, that imposter syndrome comes up again, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, but I, I kind of I can also see the impact I'm having and seeing that as, yeah, there's evidence that I've done something good for somebody there, you know, and yeah. take it as a sort of case at a time. Um, but yeah it was it was hard time those those years between my children so um we had like two in, two miscarriages and then we had all the investigations our kind of doctor fast tractors because apparently you've got to wait till you three you've had three normally yeah. um and then they found some sort of something so when i got pregnant again they gave me i was on um aspirin every day something to thin my blood yeah. and um, then i had my son uh, which was you know that's it i'm stopping now <laughs> uh, i'm not going through all that again um so there's four years between our children and uh, so they've grown up now i can't believe it my son's just turned 21 a baby wow. um so yeah it's um it was an interesting time but i grew a lot in myself um so when the bullying happened the second time i was in a better place to think this isn't me this mm. isn't me this isn't me i can't understand what's going on but there's more to me than this and that was the catalyst for getting on and starting up this wonderful um, little business um, and also what's been great about it is that I've been able to design it full control hey that's yeah. nice having control um, not, not long about a year after I started I took on an ex-colleague who had I'd gone through the same sort of bullying at the school um, Emma and she's been working with me for about four years now she's amazing but the two of us just sat down and said right well, okay we were we were treated like this how do we want to be treated and we mm. kind of formed our sort of working together policy oh, through just like well, okay are, are we going to do appraisals like no way I'm not going I've never had a good appraisal I just hate them that sitting there and somebody giving you targets of that you know not really what you want to do but they're ticking boxes somewhere no we're not having that but we'll have regular chats about what's going well what's not going well is there anything we want to learn about 
Yeah. And one of the things that came out of that is each of us uh, every year we choose a project we want to learn more about. Oh, okay. And it's just increasing our knowledge and we thoroughly investigate it and we send each other, uh, you know, information about it. So we've become kind of more expert in things. I hate that word expert because there's always more to learn, isn't there? there but we've become is. more specialised because yeah. this commitment we have to wanting to learn more and supporting each other to do that. What kind of projects have you picked? Um, one of the first ones I did was about puberty and autism. Um, we've done we've done PDA. We've done a big project on girls, and that oh. was really interesting because it led to my my colleague's daughter being diagnosed at the oh, age wow. of sixteen. Um, so yeah, that was really helpful. And her daughter, um, Olivia, does some training for us sometimes. She talks about her experience. Oh, wow. She's amazing. I think she'll be a real advocate. I might have her working for me one day. Um, so. Yeah, um, what else have we done? I did a bit of thing on writing. Um, I'm really interested in sort of psychology and brains. I think they're amazing. Brains so, amazing. yeah, anything comes up. I've done a project on ADHD. Um, that's, so, over the years, we've had like a different one, and yeah. we've kind of thoroughly investigated, read loads of research, listened to podcasts, and I love listening to people's lived experience because that's so important, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, I can then put together a course about what we've learned, and that's how I've built all these courses over the years. So, how long have you been independent now? Um, well, coming up in, in January, it'll be seven years. Wow. Yeah. And do you have kind of a, a roadmap of what the next few years look like, or do you take it as you find it? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I like the freedom of kind of responding to need, really. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I did when I first started, I was so terrified I wouldn't have enough work. Mm. I just said yes to everything. Yeah. And yep, I did I some you. really weird things, <laughs> but actually I also did some really exciting things. I mean, I wrote three books because... Um, I got in touch with LDA and I love the um, sensory products. And I'd said, you know, I'm working on my own. I can't really afford lots of things. How can I get some free stuff from you? And they <laughs> said, well, do some product reviews and we'll send you the products. And I'll, yeah, I can do that. Um, and then they sent me um, a book that somebody, uh, an outline of a book somebody was writing for them about um, supporting children in secondary school. And I've been quite a lot of work in secondary school at this point. Um, so I, I sent back my review two weeks later I got this phone call I was in the middle of a supermarket saying oh that person has dropped out would you like to write it I was like wow. well I've never written a book but hey yes because you yeah. know um, I can say yes it was a really steep learning curve and then I was just kind of finishing the first draft of the secondary one they said oh would you do the primary one and um, and we want that first so it was like a massive rush <laughs> to write the primary one. But then it came out, the primary one came out in 2016, the second one, 2017. And then I had loads and loads of social stories on my book, on my computer. And I just said, oh, I've got loads of these. Would they make a book? And I went, yeah, of course they would. So I went through, edited them all, make sure they were tickety-boo. And um, I insisted on there being a CD, you know, so people could edit them. And um, yeah, did that. So that was interesting. And then finally, I was talking to the editor. She came to my office and she said, well, have you got anything else we can look at? You know, and I have this pack of what we call the social detective pack. So when we when we set up groups within schools, we provide all the resources to do like board game based social okay. skills so it's quite structured i suppose the same sort of idea as lego based therapy but not as um structured as that and um so i'd written you know loads of stuff for it but i'd invented this little game years ago for this little boy about the concept of waiting because it's quite an arbitrary thing isn't it yeah and uh, it proved really really successful so i'd used it with quite a few children and it was part of this pack and uh, she said, oh, that's a great idea. We'll have that. And so they designed from my A4 piece of paper, which my game was on, they designed this board game, which oh, came wow. out. So it's like, well, you know, if you say yes to everything, you come up with some really interesting things that you might never have thought of doing. Yeah. Yeah, although you do have to learn to say no as well, I think, don't you? I'm working on that. <laughs> I'm struggling a bit. Yeah. And you, your work has presumably changed entirely during the pandemic as well. I know you've done loads of online training. You've really embraced that, haven't you? Yeah. I think um, I think that was in again in the first place because we were really worried about the children that we support and that we couldn't yeah. go and see them. 
So we got in touch with our schools and we offered online stuff without even knowing what we were doing. You know, I didn't know about Zoom or anything. No. Um, so we managed to keep in touch with some of our families who really needed it. And we'd phone them up or we'd do a Zoom. Uh, we'd send off resources or social stories if that's what was needed. Yeah. Um, but I also felt I found I had a lot of time on my hands. I mean, loads and loads of training was just cancelled yes. like that. Yeah. Um, so not what else can I do so and it was at that time I had that conversation with Ian I also do did quite a lot of work with a charity called the Isabella Trust in Liverpool and Tracy there had said oh we've, we've bought zoom webinars you, would you have a go at them for us <laughs> so I'll try so we set that and I was doing two a week to start with but that was really good she said at first I was really wooden and then as mm. I got more into it I became a bit more animated because you're basically sat in this room talking at a green light on my screen aren't you? yeah it's really tough I, I find actually I prefer doing large meetings than webinars because then you can see other people yeah. and although yeah. one of the things I like about doing public speaking to bigger audiences is that I don't have to interact because I find that hard but I find having nothing coming back is very difficult when yeah. you're filming and you know you're just filming I think that's fine but yeah when you're teaching and you don't know uh, yeah it's, it's it's I mean it's it's very difficult actually at first isn't it it's uh... yeah I'm a, I'm a researcher though so if I looked up on YouTube how to present online you know it came up with all these <laughs> YouTube videos um, how to do uh, video editing on my iMovie and there were videos yeah. for that so um, I kind of just copied what other people did um, yeah. but also yeah, it is hard and it's been a learning experience, but there's been some enjoyable things. I've been able to kind of stay at home and sit in my slippers yeah. and, you know, <laughs> just worry about what top you're wearing. <laughs> yeah, I have a whole wardrobe of smart tops and then I'll be sat there in like jeans and slippers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's that, it's, it has been a, a big curve, but I also think it's changed the direction I might go in after lockdown as well. Oh, really? Um, so I've, I've been training, like I've done training schools down south and I'd never travel that far, but on a Zoom where, and, and you can use breakout rooms and stuff. So yeah. we can actually run it where people are really interacting and doing yeah. activities. Um, so it gives me a wider reach, really. And that's nice without having to do it. The, tr the traveling can be really tiring, can't it? Absolutely. Interesting. And you think are... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, interesting what you said about um, being in front of an audience. Um, Hilary is one of the new teachers who's going to be working with, is autistic. And she wrote me um, a blog a, a couple of years ago about um, the sort of the different amounts of, she's a mathematician. And she talked about how many different interactions you can have in different groups of people. And mm. I think by the time you get seven people in a room, there's like over 5,000 different interactions. <gasps> wow. There's some mathematical formula for it. She's amazing. Um, but she also said that when she's presenting, she just feels like that's one person in yes. front of her. Yes. It's just one body. And so she can find, she can do that really well. Whereas if she, like she was a teaching in um, a sixth form college and when she went into the staff room, it was a completely overwhelming um, experience yeah. because of all those interactions. And yeah. I just loved how she explained that. And if you think about our kids in school, you know, that we are often asking them to work in groups and it's just, yeah. I mean, most of the children I know in I'd say it's torture you know so yeah it's difficult it's really and that's the thing I think it's 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 difficult and I don't necessarily I've never necessarily always stopped to analyze what's going on there for me but I find one of the most interesting things that will often happen is that people will say to me at a conference over coffee you know oh gosh I don't know how you stand up on stage and do that and because whatever's in my head usually just comes out of my mouth I'll normally respond with oh that's fine I have no problem doing that this is really hard <laughs> and I don't yeah. mean it in any horrible way it's yeah. just I do find it much harder interacting one-to-one -one yeah. or in a small group or in a noisy environment. Standing on stage is fine. It's, you know. Is that why you go around with the camera? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. Um, and, and I found that since I started vlogging, again, I go around and I've got a, a structure for that conversation and people avoid you. So either people have a more structured conversation or they walk away. Oh, um, it's a great strategy. <laughs> yeah. And I hide a lot as well. I take my car everywhere mm -hmm. and I hide in my car or I go hide in the toilets if I need time out. Um, it's better now that I'm open about being autistic now I know um, and, and people do give you space if you ask for it but um, mm -hmm. it's it is challenging what we do is quite hard work it's uh, yeah yeah but you're enjoying it you're enjoying the online yeah it's just different I'll be glad to get back to schools I miss the pupils that we support and you know even having a few 
online conversations with them you know i think it's been really interesting because some children have really thrived at home you know yeah. away from all that pressure i mean school is the pressure isn't it yeah. and yeah. the environment and all the challenges and and demands on them and the sensory overload you know and um, so they've actually done really well at home um others are you know they've not done anything they've really struggled to engage with anything at home so the actual transition going back to school is going to need a lot of support i think we're going to be quite busy in september yeah, I can imagine. um but you know that's what we do we love coming along i was gonna say and and that, yeah and that's it and, and it must be really reassuring for all those different schools and families that you work with knowing that you are there you are being wholly responsive and you have kept you know you've been creating the weather throughout the the whole pandemic in terms of how do we manage it what are the stories that we tell and how do we prepare mm -hmm. ourselves for these new new ways of interacting and i would imagine that your work will be used more widely as we return because i've been certainly teaching lots of schools that well the transition that you normally do with your autistic children we probably need that with all of them right now because mm. interaction you know social safety suddenly gone out the window because we don't know how to interact safely and it looks different and we need to learn again and um yeah, yeah i imagine there'll be huge call for your work but you, you I, I hope that you do feel a deep sense of of pride um i feel like yeah that imposter syndrome comes in for you but you, you you do remarkable work lynn you're one of the people who you know your name comes up every time really quickly anytime anyone's looking for work in your in your niche and, and what you do really empowers people so yeah do you know that's really lovely and i i, I really i do struggle i think one of the things i've i've always had is a struggle to take a compliment but i will say i've learned to say thank you and then i go away and i reflect <laughs> of it and then I, this lovely little fluttering in my heart comes out oh that was so nice so thank you <laughs> No, well, it's meant really genuinely, you know, I have huge, yeah. huge respect for what you do, which you can tell from the fact that whenever I'm struggling with the answer to something, I go, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's mutual, honestly, because the work you do has just informed me a lot and just helped me learn more and more. So thank you. Oh, well, thank and, you. you know, and I think that the network of people that I've got to know who are all kind of have you know a different bit of information yeah. and working together has been a joy for me. And yeah. Um, that, we do that better is, by collaborating yeah. always, I think, yeah. don't we? That's the thing. Yeah. Um, what, what thought would you like to, to leave people with? I'm thinking particularly if there's anyone out there who perhaps has tuned into this because they're struggling at work at the moment. What, what do you think they need to hear? I think, I think probably a summary of what I said earlier was to kind of find yourself, you feel out of control, so find something you can control. Um, just to kind of give yourself a foundation, take some time to reflect on where you are, what you are good at, and if what that might look like if you didn't have that person persecuting you, you know, and then that opens up your possibility of maybe, you know, can I change something here or can I change by going somewhere else? Um, don't give up, really. Get some support around you. You're not in it on your own. and have hope you can keep going that's the main thing i think